Welcome to the Did Nothing Wrong podcast, where we try to cut through the noise and help you make sense of the chaotic information space around us. I'm Griff Somke. And I'm Jay McKenzie. On this episode of the Did Nothing Wrong podcast, we get into the Groiper infestation in Arizona Congressman Paul Gasar's office with Haley from Arizona Right Wing Watch. We also cover the latest Trump 2024 campaign idiocy, the campaign to portray Patriot Front as a left wing group, and MAGA's latest martyr. If you like what you're hearing, please give us a rating and a review on the app that you're listening on. Be sure to subscribe at didnothingwrongpod.com to get our content straight into your inbox. All of our work is free, but we're extremely grateful for paid subscriptions and donations that ensure that we can keep doing this important work. Thank you. Haley, welcome to Did Nothing Wrong. We're really glad to have you here today. This is going to be fun. Hello. Thank you for having me. So what's great about this story with the Gosar staffer being a Nick Fuentes acolyte here is that nobody on the right seems to want to talk about it. They just no. <laughs> want this story to completely go away. Have you seen anyone from Gosar's office respond in any way to this? Um, no, Gosar said no comment. And then he told another reporter yesterday, like, take a hike. Because <laughs> <laughs> like the few reporters that have been trying to get a hold of his office have been telling me, you know, what his responses are. And it's just no comment every time. God. Same thing with his like communications team. Just nothing. <laughs> so and then nobody else like publicly is really said anything either in the GOP. Right. What about any of the Groypers or any of the ex Fuentes loyalists? Anybody on that side of things talking about it? Well, I watched Fuentes' stream, like first stream since the news broke. I f he was being kind of weird, being really insistent that there was no news in Groyper world this week. <laughs> and I so also he... watched Kill Stream. Uh, I'm sorry. Mm. <laughs> They watched the Democracy Now! interview with Hunter Walker, who wrote the article. Mm -hmm. And um, Ethan Ralph didn't say anything. He was just being his usual, like, annoying, obnoxious self. Yeah. But a few chatters, you could tell, knew who Chicken was. Like, they were <laughs> like, what? Chicken got doxxed? And, like, we're spelling his name correctly. Uh... Yeah. But it's been pretty quiet in, like, official Fuentes world. Because if they say anything, then it fully confirms it, right? <laughs> right, right. It seems like Nick is probably being a little extra careful because he knows he's got uh, a lot of people lurking and reporters and people who follow this stuff who are wanting him to, to say something or elaborate. And for now, he's just going to, I guess, be careful with this one. But it, as far as we know, Wade Searle is still, he's taken the Nick Fuentes Groiper loyalty pledge. He's still on the team. And there's no indication that he's been fired from Gosar's office, correct? No, and Gosar, like, turned comments off on his Twitter, which I feel like was intentional. Mm -hmm. And then last night he tweeted, like, a 2020 Trump quote that was, like, about being canceled. Of course. <laughs> uh -huh. And it kind of felt like a response, you know? Yeah, our country wasn't built by cancel culture speech codes and soul-crushing conformity. We are not a nation of timid spirits. We are a nation of fierce, proud, and independent patriots. And I noticed some gripers replying W in it, so mm. I feel like it's kind of a they know. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us how you found your way to this story? Did you get a tip, or was it part of the normal research that you do on the far right? Yeah, it is kind of just my normal, like, lurking around. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Nick Martin have been like kind of looking into this for months hmm. before Hunter hooked up with us because he also independently figured it out and then found us, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it was kind of like this open secret. Mm. The way I found out was basically when, you know, when there was like a griper schism. Yes. Yes. Yeah. During that time, a few of them snitched on chicken. Hmm. Simon Dickerman was one of them. A few other, like, Nazis I won't name. <laughs> so Simon Dickerman's, like, a defector from the Fuentes folks. And he fully, like, snitched on Chicken and, like, showed his photos and showed internal chats between Wade Searle and other more well-known Groypers to show that he was, like, kind of in the more inside team with Fuentes, not just, like, a random groupie. <laughs> right. How difficult was it? to get to the point that 
you could take this to journalists and you felt like they would print it? Was it was a quite a bit of fact checking and back and forth? Yeah, because he's he wiped most of his accounts. The chicken accounts have been deleted, but we all have our ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm pretty sure he deleted them because he was just so openly running the account as Wade under this chicken pseudonym that like he had no choice but to just wipe the account. Well, one was banned, but another one he deleted. A lot of them he deleted because he posted his photos on there and like had Wade in his bio. And yeah, he had photos of himself at Stop the Steal with Nick (laughs) Fuentes and like Baked Alaska and Jaden McNeil and Vincent James Fox. Uh. And then he actually held the like an America first flag behind Nick at Arizona Stop the Steal. And that was like his banner pick across like all of his social media, like with his face and everything. Like he wasn't exactly the best at hiding his uh, <laughs> identity. Did he try to kind of backtrack and, and cover his tracks a little bit after he got hired by Gosar's office? Or did he just not really even try? Yeah, I think that's why some of it was deleted. Okay, yeah. Because if you look at some of the early clips, you know how like Groypers are like either they go into politics or like do streaming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It seemed like he and his friend wanted to kind of do the streaming thing. They tried to like do debates on like other griper channels all that's been wiped hmm. so yeah once he got the job with gosar it seems like he wanted to hide all that like the chicken account on gab is still technically up it's just blank right now like he just okay. c- cleared everything yeah and i saw he did something similar on telegram i just took a look so yeah it, it is interesting because um i guess he didn't go to college he was only a few years removed from high school so it, lo- it looks like he was just some a, a zoomer nationalist as they might call themselves and he was just posting and one way or another he got into this job but i can see why he wasn't trying to cover his tracks because if you're 18 19 20 year old kid and you're essentially shit posting on the internet why would you think that a uh, u.s congressman is going to come come around and hire you but he did <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it seems like a lot of these kind of people keep showing up in paul gosar's orbit he has this guy he's spoken at fuentes's conference he was working with ali alexander at one point what's up with gosar why is this guy (laughs) is is this guy like crypto yeah i think he's just a fascist right like i think we could just call gosar like forget the crypto part yeah just like he's just a fascist like like okay so he came in on the the old tea party wave oh you know yeah he barely squeaked by a win because sarah palin actually endorsed him (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And then ever since then, he's just been running in like really safe red areas. His last election, he didn't even have an opponent. (laughs) Wow. Okay. Yeah, we were we were going to ask about that, because what what does his district look like that they keep electing Mm -hmm. him? Yeah. And honestly, I think part of the area has a lot of reservation land where Gosar used to represent when Wade first started working for him. And some of Wade's comments as chicken and the amount of hate he seems to have for indigenous people is like pretty alarming since Gosar represents that area and Gosar's kind of had anti native comments in the past. Oh boy. Um, and it's like you represent this area and you're like a white supremacist. This feels like extra political. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah, is there is there any minority group that Gosar has not attacked at this point? I, I don't I don't think maybe there Italians. Is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what got you started personally doing this kind of stuff? Well, uh, you know, I think COVID radicalized a lot of people. And uh, I was just sticking inside during COVID and being safe and trying not to get sick. Um, and I've always had an interest in politics and like cults and the far right. Hmm. I was raised a Jehovah's Witness. Ah. Uh, third gen. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah, once Stop the Steal happened and like I was just doing nothing because COVID was going on and I had just caught it. I had I got COVID like right before the election. So I was uh... like, well, I'm not going to get it. So let's go to these rallies. And then I just started to go to everything. Like my dad passed away. So I just kind of was like, well, I'm not going to go to work for a while. And I'm just going to like, I guess, just do this. I don't know. Uh, So for like a year straight, I just went to like everything I could possibly go to. And yeah, right now I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just kind of like still kind of uh, dealing with 
whatever it is I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally Every... independent. So it's like, uh, I have no credibility or anything, but sometimes I get to write for things because I actually do a little bit know what I'm talking about. It's just, uh, Hey, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. A story like this and contributing, it's a, it's, it's a great place to start. You could do much worse. Yeah. Yeah. I've written for like left coast, right watch in the past, if you know them, but yeah, it's always yeah. under the Arizona right watch name. Okay. Okay. This was my first, like, it has to be my name. <laughs> <laughs> you say you went to pretty much everything. I'm, I'm guessing mostly or maybe entirely in Arizona. How central is Arizona to the current far right movement, to the Groypers, to Fuentes? Is it? Is there a lot more going on in Arizona than there is in your average state right now? I definitely feel like we're one of the more Groyper friendly states. The thing is that like it's not that big of a movement like it's like it is for like a white supremacist movement. But like in terms of like a political movement, it's really not that big. And I feel like Gosar is one of the pol few politicians that gives it like the political legitimacy that they crave. Right. So, yeah, you see a lot of griper activity in Arizona. Wendy Rogers, if you've ever heard of her, she's mm. a state legislator here. Right. She's extremely griper friendly. Like she's literally tweeted like, we love you, Nick Fuentes. And. I'm based because Nick Fuentes has said I'm based. <laughs> <laughs> it is interesting how how much Arizona features for the Groypers, but also it was a, a central feature of Charlie Kirk's TPUSA movement, at least until recently. It, and it still is, but they really wanted to get Carrie Lake elected. And well, some people are still trying to elect Carrie Lake, supposedly. They're, they've still got their court cases going. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. How do you uh, how do you rate her odds at this point? She's our next governor. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any second now. After that court case is over this week, it's, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Also, we had the audit. You remember the Maricopa audit? The Cyber Ninja audit? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That definitely. was like, I kind of feel like a big deal. And like just a example of how absurdly anti-democracy our Republican Party is. Uh -huh. Like they're still literally trying to overturn the election, as you said, with Carrie Lake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With QAnon people or at least QAnon adjacent people to uh, helping her out with those lawsuits and, and amplifying all that on Twitter. It it sort of changes, but not really. Yeah. And also definitely true about the charlie kirk thing turning point usa is headquartered here so right. we get all their bullshit like all their ambassadors show up to all of our school board meetings and harass people oh god of course they do also alliance defending freedom is headquartered here people might not know who they are as much but they're like the legal giant that is responsible for basically everything shitty in this world um, <laughs> people have probably heard of like like Hobby Lobby birth control. Right, right, right. Yep. Case yep. Or the Masterpiece Cakes case. Oh, was that the, the, yeah, they didn't want to bake a cake for a gay wedding. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And then um, more recently, like they've helped, you know, dismantle Roe and they're the ones currently going after the abortion pill and stuff. So uh -huh. it's just like Arizona's like the headquarters for like these really shitty places yeah. mike yeah <laughs> yeah yeah well and even even tpusa and the groypers kind of sort of hate each other and that's there's some truth to that but they also kind of piggyback off of each other and they need each other yeah, every year there's like every every america fest that's the festival turning point mm -hmm. in arizona there's always like a cross the street groyper event where like you know more extreme people are trying to radicalize the people at the turning point mm -hmm. but there's some like intermixing going on you know mm -hmm. even though the groypers do generally hate turning point usa you know <laughs> good recruitment grounds yeah so back to cyril did you get a picture of who this guy was it seems like him and his even his parents were into trump pretty hard okay i was just reading all his tweets during like the insurrection and like his mom was literally crying when it happened and then she mm -hmm. cried again, like according to his tweets. And then she cried when like Biden was inaugurated and he was big into like, you know, the election was stolen for Trump. Mm -hmm. but he did have a lot of just like groiper beliefs. Like he didn't believe that women should be in the workforce. Speak. Right. Yeah, literally. He yeah. it didn't make the article, but like 
some of those leaked chats he was literally talking shit about like gosar's female staffers like he doesn't think they should even be working you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is pretty common with the nick fuentes type opinion ideology Mm -hmm. definitely does not like jews (laughs) <laughs> yeah shocker yeah that was gonna be our our next question how would you categorize searle is he a white nationalist a neo-nazi we know if he's he's pledging loyalty to nick fuentes he's somewhere along there but you read the tweets you went through this what would what would you use to describe him yeah i think he's definitely like a, a white nationalist at least he, he he had a lot of posts about just like white superiority um, before he started making edits for the Gosar team, he was making edits just for the chicken accounts. A lot of them were highlighting like black on white crime kind of stuff, uh, right. black crime statistics type stuff, just like, yeah, one of those, some like anti-trans stuff. He had a lot of these like just edits that were, you know, politically charged and Groiper related and like kind of pushing Groiper politics. And I saw like a in one interaction, a Groiper responded like, these are really good edits. You should continue making propaganda for the movement. <laughs> and he responds like, that's the plan. Hmm. A thing that I think a lot of people are missing from the article is that they see that Gosar hired this like, you know, Fuentes acolyte. And they're like, yeah, no shit. A lot of people in his office probably follow Fuentes. But he's his digital director, mm-hmm. and a lot of the weird memes that a lot of people don't get that goes our posts. Right. There's something off about him, but they they can't fully explain like what the fuck is up with these memes that <laughs> he's been posting and a lot of this content. And it's like, well, he has this digital director that probably has pretty good access to his accounts and is at least making a lot of these edits. And he's making Groiper propaganda and then feeding it through the Gosar accounts. Which feels pretty significant. It doesn't seem like anything to a lot of people, but it's signaling to like, yeah, this white nationalist group, cult, whatever you want to call it. Well, like normally you'd have kind of a vanilla intern running these accounts. Someone who just, okay, I have to stay on message. I have to say the right thing. I don't want to embarrass anyone. Here is here is what my boss wants people to read. And I'm going to make sure there's no typos. There's no problems. And then here's this guy who probably has access to Gosar's account, at least some of the time, pumping out white nationalist, neo-Nazi, just really hateful rhetoric and memes. And yeah, that is a that is a pretty clear divergence from from the norm for politics. And and that is a, an amount of influence that is concerning. Yeah, it is very concerning. I'm, I'm right there with you. So you mentioned on Twitter that. Uh, no journalist had reached out to you before. Has anyone reached out? Since? I know that was about a day ago. Has anyone reached out since? And if they haven't, do you, why do you think that is? Arizona Jewish News reached out, but so far that's it because it's dealing with Paul Gosar. So he's pretty anti-Semitic. So. <laughs> right. But uh, besides that, no. AZ Central, which the Arizona Republic, which is like the paper of record here. Okay. Um, did put an op-ed out that, again, was just like, yeah, no shit. Uh, he posts weird shit. <laughs> But it's like, again, the point is like, yeah, it's probably this griper that's posting a lot of this stuff that feels important. But I think a lot of people just don't like the Anon thing that I usually do. They have to do their own research to confirm my research. And Mm -hmm. uh, I think just the current media landscape doesn't allow for that, really. It's like they need quick stories about whatever's viral on the timeline and easy to write, I think. I don't know. That's my opinion. That's my... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you mentioned this, and I think there is a sense that, well, of course, Gosar did this. And I think some people have just kind of given up. It's that sense of, well, yeah, he's a white nationalist. And of course, he hired a Groiper. He's palled around with Fuentes. And we can write these stories, but we've written them before and nothing's going to change. And there's some truth to that, because Kevin McCarthy is not commenting. Nobody in the House GOP is saying anything, including Gosar. But yeah, shouldn't they be or shouldn't we be pushing them to or it can be kind of a distraction. But are we are we just at the point where we just let this go? That's scary to me. Is that, mm-hmm. I'm sure that's scary to you. Yeah, I think indifference is bad. <laughs> yeah, Like yeah. Uh, just saying like whatever is just not a good response. Like if nothing's going to get done if nobody says anything. You know, right. it's like, OK, so this Wade just goes on to continue to move up in. DC and then like what becomes my next congressman? No thank you. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Gosar is going to go out and hire three more Groypers, which he, it's mentioned in the story that there may be another person in his office that is also a Groyper that in this this account, this chicken account was at one at least at one point shared and it's not clear when it stopped being shared. Uh because there's so many accounts, like so many chicken accounts, there was definitely one where they said it wasn't just Wade running it. It was someone named Landon. And that would be Landon Peterson, who's now Gosar's intern, because he made that clear on his own personals also. He, like, promoted the chicken accounts on his Landon Peterson socials. So, again, they weren't, like, really good at hiding it. No. Okay, so he's already got these two, like, groupers in office. When the story came out, I saw this guy replying, Patriot J did it first. (laughs) And so I looked into that guy and like, yeah, some other Graper guy uh, was briefly an intern with Gosar. And after that story broke, someone pointed out that Rory McShane has done business with Vincent James Fox, who's also. Right. I mean, he's he's in the Graper scene, but that dude's just a straight up. Oh, yeah. No, no. He's he's just a. (laughs) That guy's awful. He talks about like throwing gay people off roofs. We had a clip from him on a couple episodes ago when we were talking about Tucker Carlson, and it was a clip of Vincent James saying things like, Tucker says the things, you know, he he can't say the things I can say, but he can say them in front of far more people. Yeah. He's gross. Speaking of Tucker, it's like, like, you know how a lot of people weren't surprised by Tucker's writers being like pole trolls? creatures mm. in the internet mm-hmm. but like they still lost their jobs right didn't that one that kind of got exposed get like lose his job oh yeah 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 there are at least two There's... which i thought was interesting it's like okay so tucker got rid of like the more explicit white supremacists on his team and it's like so far gosar seems to be sticking by him yeah yeah i noticed one of the quotes that gosar had about all of this was and this back in the beginning of april where he was asked about fuentes and he said something to the effect of Fuentes has a problem with his mouth. And it's kind of like, he's not necessarily saying anything other than Fuentes says the quiet part out loud too much here. Yeah, I didn't see that as a disavowal, like so many said. That boy needs to learn to shut up. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Kind of like, stop dropping the Jewish question so much, bro. Yeah. I felt like it was kind of like more that. Yeah, and and let's keep our discussions in the back room, not in in public where everyone knows we're talking. Save it for the group chat. Yeah. Definitely. Like, stop being so loud on the timeline. (laughs) No kidding. So kind of looking forward a little bit, Arizona seems to be one of the real battleground states going into 2024. It's a state that kind of shocked everyone in 2020, including us, when it was called for Biden. And and then it proved that wasn't entirely a fluke by electing a Democratic governor and senator in 2022. What For now. For now. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the Cary Lake trial is going on right now. Don't be respectful. Right, right. So <laughs> speaking of the Cary Lake trial, you know, what are what are the feelings on the ground like? That could right be our in... governor you're talking about. Indeed. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> governor filter. <laughs> so what's the feeling on the ground like right now about 2024? Do you think Democrats are going to hold this or do you think the backlash is coming? Well, I would like to believe that the Democrats could. Okay, so the problem with Arizona is that it's extremely purple. You know, we got like we we did get the governor, Katie Hobbs, beat Carrie Lake, which was nice. We got a blue uh, attorney general, which was nice, and secretary of state. But the legislature is still majority red, Mm -hmm. which is why we've still been getting so many awful bills voted through and then vetoed by Katie Hobbs. So the main thing that I think we have to do is switch the legislature if we ever want to do anything positive in the state but it's kind of hard because i mean there's a lot of gerrymandering and the redistricting kind of fucked some places but the democrats just need some motivation to fucking run against these people sometimes i feel like like some people went up against with no competitor like you know anthony kern you know who that is i think so he stormed the capitol on january 6th right (laughs) Right. Uh, he was a he's he was a legislator here, and then lost his seat, and then just in this twenty twenty election got another seat, and he had no opponents. And it's like, come on, come on. Yeah. And when you say that they're the legislature is red, you mean you mean very very red, very MAGA or extremist or both friendly. The moderates are pretty much gone, right? So some of these people, even in these red districts have taken such extreme positions that I guess you're you're what you're hinting at here is it might actually be possible to flip some of this stuff if if someone tries. 
Oh, definitely. I think if like some effort was put into some of these areas, it's only one in the House and the Senate. So like we literally just need to flip a seat, you know. <laughs> but like, first of all, they need, I don't know, like more motivation to run against these. I don't know why people don't run against these people. Honestly, I don't understand that part of politics. <laughs> we have to like get these people out of here. But also, you have to want to actually change things here. <laughs> right. And not just yeah. like get the seat and then just like, yeah, I got the seat. And now I'm using this as an opportunity to uh, get an upgrade in DC. That's what I notice a lot of happens here. It's like we get like maybe a seemingly good representative. And then immediately they're like, okay, I'm quitting because I'm going to now run for Congress now. There's mm. like currently three or four Dems that are like, stepping down because they're going to run for higher office and it's like i feel like a lot of these people just see it as kind of a career move rather than a way to enact change in our area like local yeah. politics is where you're going to get the most effective change in your direct area mm -hmm. and i think too many people just see it as like a stepping stone to higher politics or they're just like small business tyrants that already live here and just are trying to make things better for themselves right yeah if that makes sense i i'm really i have a negative no, it totally makes sense. Things, so. so it seems to me, Haley, like what you're talking about in terms of local politics is we need people who realize that democracy is under threat and see this as less of a career and more of a calling. And it's it's hard to convince people to do that. But in kind of talking about the threat that we're facing, we do have to ask about the next election and a guy like Nick Fuentes, the Groypers, the people that you listen to and watch and and you you consume their content, you know what they're thinking. They may have been kind of annoyed with Trump, sick of him, and they might even be sick of him now. But when push comes to shove in the end, you think pretty much all of these guys, whether it's Wade Searle or Gosar or Fuentes, are they getting on the Trump train? You know, honestly, I do feel like the griper types are still on the Trump train a bit because I think they see him as he might not be as extreme as DeSantis because like they shit talk DeSantis for being like, quote unquote, cucked on Israel. Mm -hmm. But it's like you could say the same thing about Trump. They've criticized Trump for like having Ivanka as his daughter. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there were there were, like campaign posters in Israel of of Trump and Netanyahu together that Netanyahu put up. It's <laughs> it's not like yeah, but but they do see it differently. You're right. But I think it's because they see Trump as like a symbol. You know, right. he just moved the needle more than any other politician. I think they see him as a way to bring all the MAGA groups together under this banner of white nationalism under trump he pushes the message better than anyone in their opinion it seems right which is interesting because i feel like DeSantis is worse he doesn't have a personality no and that's you know you need a bombastic personality to get around and like a character and yeah i think they see value in trump as like a figure He's a wrecking ball. Mm -hmm. He's he's just the the ultimate destroyer of norms and anything approaching moderation. And that that is that is his best quality it, it, uh, that I think that they see and that they want more of because they hate the status quo. Even even the parts of the status quo that are kind of good and the parts of society that still work, they don't really want any of that. No. Yeah. So um, they like Trump. <laughs> yeah and i i've noticed like uh again i wendy rogers she's she's also mentioned like we're not done with trump yet desantis can wait trump still has his four years like right. so i think the like most vocal loyalists will like trump loyalists will probably move the needle on this conversation like the bullies yeah. right right <laughs> yeah no they're gonna bully everyone into line and uh well it's worked before so it's probably gonna work again like i've seen desantis live i literally fell asleep <laughs> He's boring. <laughs> They're going to keep trying because there are yeah. so many people who just don't want to have to admit that they would vote for Trump. But they're going to find themselves with that choice. I mean, we don't we've talked about it a lot. We don't really see any way that DeSantis gets this this year. He's just not that guy. And once the debates roll around, oh, boy, Trump is just going to kill him. Or if he just keeps talking. Uh, 
I know DeSantis has worked on his laugh at least a, f a few times. You know, he's doing those <laughs> rehearsals and he's working and oh, I'm going to get it this time. And then he's just ah! he, he's <laughs> he can fake a personality and it's it's not good. No. It, do it doesn't turn out well. No, <laughs> no it just seems like kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but Carrie Lake will be vice president. I'm calling that now. That I'm, gonna, I'm saying that on this podcast. I, I think she's going to be the vice president pick. I think there's a very good chance of that. I think mm -hmm. that is a, a very solid prediction. Yeah. So we will mark that down and uh, <laughs> we'll save our place in the, in the book. <laughs> uh -huh. And we're definitely going to have to have you back closer to the election as well. Kind of give us an update of what's going on the, on the ground in Arizona, because like we said, we think Arizona is going to be one of the battlegrounds going forwards into 2022. And yeah, great to have somebody who can tell us what's up locally for that. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Thank you. Also, we're kind of like a swing state now, huh? Mm -hmm. Like I've never been that before. That's crazy. Right? Yeah. Things are changing. They are. <laughs> <laughs> well you can find Haley on twitter at az underscore rww or on substack at arizona right watch dot substack dot com we're also going to add her link tree in the show notes which you can visit if you'd like to support her work which you should because it's awesome <laughs> Haley, thank you so much for coming on with us today we really appreciate your time this has been great oh yeah that was really fun <laughs> cool yeah that's awesome too. yeah thanks so much for joining us we had a we had a lot of fun and Appreciate you sharing your knowledge and uh, stay safe out there. Indeed. Oh, yeah, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Switching gears here, Jay and I had a couple more topics that we wanted to cover today. Well, speaking of agent provocateurs who are desperate for attention, Laura Loomer made a bit of news recently that we need to bring up. Here she is in an interview with Steve Bannon, making a whole lot out of a nothing story. I have, you know, some training given the fact that I, you know, have a background doing undercover journalism. So I have uh, some individuals here who are also tracking these election officials. We just had somebody uh, confront and ambush Adrian Fontes uh, and ask him about why he is calling Republican voters MAGA fascists. These are people who are supposed to be overseeing our elections and they're calling Trump supporters and Republicans fascists. And you can't get inside the spy museum because it's closed. So the only option was to, you know, literally book a room in the same hotel as them so they can't kick them out of the hotel and then chase them outside as they're entering and leaving this conference. Normally, we put Laura Loomer's stunt firmly in the camp of ignore, 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 because she's a far right bigot who pulls off absurd stunts for attention. Mm -hmm. And most of them are hilariously bad. And we don't like giving her airtime, but when it blows up and... When it's this particular topic, we feel like we have to because her quote unquote work for election integrity uh, <laughs> really did, <laughs> really did blow up. And she's still talking about it on Twitter. And of course, election integrity is the phrase that the right uses these days when they're actively working to undermine our elections and disenfranchise as many minorities. Uh, sorry, anti-Trump, trans Tifa, communist voters as possible get it right but get it right yes sorry take two uh <laughs> but things are going to get crazy in the lead up to 2024 we know this and they might even get crazier after election day because well that happened in 2020 as we all mm -hmm. remember and this seemed like a, as good a time as any to start talking about what the steel is going to look like in the upcoming presidential election because it's coming. Right. And like you said, this story did kind of blow up. As you heard in the clip, Loomer showed up at a conference on securing the elections. And then she did all the Loomer things that led to her getting kicked out of the conference. Well, allegedly kicked out. We're not taking her at her word here because she's Laura Loomer. And then came the praise and adoration. She harassed some people. She followed them around. Roger Stone picked it up. Steve Bannon picked it up. Even Elon Musk responded to Loomer on Twitter with praise. Yeah, I found that pretty hilarious because if you remember, Donald Trump announced and then rescinded the offer for Loomer to join his 2024 campaign earlier this year. Trump wanted her because she is 100% pro-Trump and definitely <laughs> anti-DeSantis. Sure is. Not hiding that at all. She's out there on social media spreading the MAGA word every day. So, of course, Trump wanted her on the campaign, um, but his advisors didn't want Loomer's toxic brand attached to them. 
And yeah, boy, is she is she toxic. absolutely she's she's worked for the right wing rat fucking operation project veritas she's collaborated extensively with alex jones she's spread some really inflammatory islamophobic rhetoric and and laura loomer is jewish but has also said she supports christian nationalism and before that she said she supported white nationalism <laughs> and we could go on but she loves trump and that's good enough for Trump. His campaign, however, eventually passed because they actually have a real campaign this time. Mm -hmm. And Trump is apparently listening to them. Uh, Still, Loomer is is not too toxic for Elon Musk to praise her. He thinks she's great. Well, really, though, of course, because is anyone too toxic for Elon Musk? Almost no one. Almost. (laughs) QAnon influencers, Kremlin propagandists. Andrew Anglin. Yeah, the, the amount of neo-Nazis he's brought back to the platform. But we've 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 mentioned all this. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that almost almost no one. The only person I remember him refusing to reinstate on Twitter was Alex Jones. But I also kind of think give him a few more months. Let's let's see how much more radical he can get. And especially as Elon gets more and more desperate to turn Twitter into a profitable enterprise. He's already got Tucker moving his show to Twitter. Is InfoWars next? <laughs> Elon's natural competitor here is going to be the, the right wing YouTube alternative rumble. They allow Alex Jones and Nick Fuentes content. So why doesn't Twitter? Why doesn't the free speech absolutist right. who owns Twitter? Right. He's eventually going to get to that point where his loyal audience is either going to get what they want out of the guy or they're going to start turning on Twitter's supposed free speech champion owner. I mean, Cat Turd already starting to get a little upset there with some of the things he thinks he's being throttled for. How long is it before the rest of them go? And even though Elon has appointed a new Twitter CEO, I don't really see any reason to expect much to change. And she's from the advertising world and she's there to bring back the ad revenue. Yeah, and I don't know why she wants this job, especially Elon's still out there posting about PSYOPs and defending it in interviews with CNBC and comparing himself to Inigo Montoya from The Princess Bride and spreading anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about Soros as Magneto. (laughs) There's plenty more, but... Elon hired this woman and she definitely seems to be right wing, but he's still the owner and he's still posting like a 4chan troll. Indeed he is. Did you see Mandy Patinkin's clap back on that? I did. That was, (laughs) that was quite, quite clever. (laughs) I do not think that means what you think it means. Yes. If you haven't seen that movie, ladies and gentlemen, go see the princess bride. It is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant work of cinema and then read the book. It's even better. Yeah, and Elon should take some time and watch the movie until he actually gets it. Maybe stop tweeting, but he seems physically incapable of doing that. So anyway, here was the reply from Musk to Loomer. Strange that election officials from pivotal regions attended a far left conference when they're supposed to be impartial. Yeah, if only if only we we could understand what this man's politics were. Mm -hmm. If only. If only we knew. He seems to be one of those, like, neither left nor right kind of people. What do we call those? Mm. Would it be a third position of some sort? <laughs> the man is certainly consistent, although he he certainly seems to be consistently repeating MAGA Republican talking points. So tell me what else we're seeing right now as far as the 2024 election. We've got Laura Loomer showing up at this conference. Who else is laying the groundwork for the 2024 version of election denial? Yeah, I don't think it's going to surprise you to learn that Roger Stone and Mike Flynn are a big part of this, as are the usual suspects we see around them. They're essentially already admitting they're going to lose in 2024, but not really lose. Right, right. And so they have to go into it knowing the the Steelers are (laughs) already stealing and the votes won't matter because the Jewish space lasers and George Soros implanted microchips made by Bill Gates to change the vote tallies via, I guess, uh, Chinese spy balloons. Indeed. Yes, I've heard this. I've heard a lot about this. Many people are saying that this is happening. Yes. So I, I do think 
their 2024 plans are in pretty early stages, but they're they're definitely looking at what they can do at the local level, at a state level level or county by county wherever they think they can throw a wrench in the system they will and and this there's a recent post i I won't call it an article it's (laughs) conspiracy website where mike flynn publishes sometimes called western journal but he wrote that our governors must be at the forefront of any and all solutions all governors but especially red state governors need to consider nullifying federal laws and regulations not specifically authorized by the constitution and the in the same post he later added this suggestion is not complex and its most important ingredient is to start locally and elect state office holders who have the guts to follow the founders original vision of a decentralized government in which the vast majority of power is in the hands of the states. Local action can have a national impact, but only if we, the people, stand up and speak out. (laughs) He talks about the Founders' original vision. Well, the the Founders' original vision was called the Articles of Confederation, Mm -hmm. and we tried that before we wrote the Constitution, and it gave far too much power to the states, and it didn't work. The reason they stopped, (laughs) they didn't, keep it is because it didn't work because the federal government had essentially no power and the states were bickering and fighting over every damn thing Mm -hmm. and it just didn't work so they tore it up and tried again but he's clever enough this was an original vision that it seems like he's kind of alluding to this this state power essentially what he's talking about is state power that transcends national power Mm -hmm. and that was an original vision that failed yes after a few years and they stopped so it drowned in the bathtub yeah yeah but this is the game plan Mm -hmm. and it it is divorced from sanity and reality but it's what they're trying. And and MAGA pushed hard to win in Arizona and Pennsylvania in 2022 in the governor's races, in part because they wanted their people in place for 2024. They think the governors or local legislatures can nullify election results in 2024. And Trump's people are going to keep pushing until at least some of these people bend to their will. And keep in mind that the right sees Musk's Twitter ownership as a key part of their plan in 2024. Mike Flynn recently tweeted that Twitter is going to be incredibly critical as the 2024 season ramps up. It's kind of self-evident, but again, it's still worth saying. The fight, to some extent, is here. Yeah, it is. And and one last thing I wanted to point out is the... MAGA Republicans are going to keep reminding us of things like likely U.S. voters believe there's massive fraud in U.S. elections. And they do. Real polls from real polling outfits confirm this. And and so they're going to keep beating this drum. But of course, the right isn't going to tell you that this is largely the result of their constant and continuous claims of fraud, which they keep failing time and time again, to actually prove in court. Right, right. It's propaganda 101, advertising 101, repetition, repetition, repetition. They keep saying there's fraud, so it must be true. Yeah, Tim Pool, Steve Bannon, and Charlie Kirk wouldn't dare lie to their audiences, right? Oh, no, no, no. Heaven forbid they'd never do that. Well, speaking of extremist performance artists, a group called Patriot Front did one of their periodic marches through Washington, D.C., For those of you who mercifully haven't heard of these guys, they're a white supremacist group led by a tiny little man named Thomas Rousseau, and their big thing is rallies and marches. They are quite competent at getting tens to hundreds of adherents to don their uniform, which is khaki pants, boots, blue jacket, face masks, and then march through the streets somewhere in a show of force. They're very obsessed with the aesthetic of their movement. They care a lot Mm -hmm. about how they look in their propaganda. Sometimes, like this most recent rally in Washington, D.C., they're able to get through their little event without any major incidents or arrest. And sometimes the exact opposite happens, like this recent demonstration at the Pride event in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. We are finding out more tonight about the arrest of 31 members of a white supremacist group allegedly plotting to riot at a pride event up in Idaho. They were discovered Saturday, packed into the back of a U-Haul truck, all wearing similar clothing and white face coverings. 
Police were tipped off by somebody who saw these guys loading masks and shields into a truck and told the police that they looked like a little army. The men are reportedly members of the Patriot Front. This is a white nationalist group, and we're, we're heading to an LGBTQ pride event to riot. I will tell you, it, it appeared to be very similar to an operations plan that a police or military group would uh, put together for a days of, uh, for an event. Uh, there was at least one smoke grenade. Um, there was multiple shields. Uh, they were all wearing hats that had um, uh, plastic inside them, um, shin guards, shields, things of that nature. And they weren't local. The suspects came from at least 11 different states. They're all facing misdemeanor charges for a conspiracy to riot. But the FBI is now involved in the investigation as well. Of course, usual suspects on the right tried to deny that these guys exist at all. And when that was too ridiculous, they claimed that they were feds, which is what they always say about people on their side whose behavior they find embarrassing. And the reality here is the FBI doesn't create these groups. I am absolutely certain there are FBI informants within the ranks of Patriot Front and pick a far-right, neo-Nazi, white nationalist organization, there are FBI informants in it. Mm -hmm. The legacy of J. Edgar Hoover's COINTELPRO was not always pretty or good. We're not here to say the FBI has anything close to a spotless record, but they have a long history of breaking up and infiltrating white supremacist, neo-Nazi organizations. They started doing this really in the 1960s. And how they did it is by infiltration. It's by gathering informants, some or most of whom got co-opted after the fact, after they had joined. And most of these guys don't tend to be upstanding citizens. And they usually have legal problems that can be that can only be mitigated by a little help from the feds with some information you might know. See, they're not quite literally FBI agents pretending to be white supremacists. They're co-opted assets. That's how this works. Here's Rumble user The Salty Cracker with some typical MAGA gaslighting about Patriot Front. But no, when it comes to Patriot Front, they're escorted. Nobody messes with them. They're completely escorted. They got all their vans lined up. Who's renting these vans? With Zuckerbucks, most likely. They're all wearing masks. There's nobody around them supporting them. There is no organic support. Like, there is nobody cheering them on. These are fucking assholes. Nobody's on these people's. This is the fucking... When you graduate from Quantico, you're, you're, this, is, this is your graduation ceremony. You, you have to do this. This is how you... Before you get your fucking desk in FBI's asshole building, you have to go do this. This is, this is how they haze these fucking idiots or something. So they dress these fucking goofballs up and they send them out there. And this is what you need to do when the amount of white supremacy doesn't meet the demand in this country. You manufucking facture it. Yeah. And it's this idea that white supremacists no longer exist. So it must be the mm -hmm. feds. It must be a false flag or a psyop is, is just a convenient story that far-right MAGA influencers tell to their audience. Tucker said this quite a bit on his show. And yeah, I, I do think it's worth pointing out that if this group really was controlled by the FBI, if this was all just an FBI op, and yes, there were credible claims of the FBI doing this in the days of Hoover actually creating or at least controlling some extremist organizations. But in, in the year of our Lord, 2023, does anyone really think <laughs> that if this group was controlled by the FBI, if all these guys were FBI agents, do you have any doubt that the right, that Jim Jordan, that Kevin McCarthy, that pick, pick one of these people, mm -hmm. wouldn't have 10 whistleblowers lined up to tell the world all about this. This is one of those things that changed after the original, the real, the real one, the church committee that happened in the 1970s. It led to a revamp. There is a lot more scrutiny now than really there's ever been of the FBI. And for the most part, that's a good thing. There's, mm -hmm. there's some 
Republican machinations and MAGA's fawning over Trump, some of that is getting into the extremely unhelpful camp. But some oversight is good. But but the FBI keeping tabs on extremists is not the same thing as creating and controlling them and the whole thing being a psyop uh, against your favorite president or against against the Republican Party. That's not what's happening here. No, no. Here's Dan Bongino on his Rumble show. Even if that group is real, and folks, they may be, if that group is real and they're some neo-Nazi group, then one, they're abhorrent life losers, and that's obvious. But that's a left-leaning ideology. Don't ask me to ideologically engage in this game of, 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 of uh, mousetrap. Those people have nothing to do with me at all. I can condemn them because I condemn stupidity and evil. I don't need to condemn them because you're telling me like they're my ideological buddies. They're your ideological buddies, not mine. I'm telling you, this is a trap. A hundred percent, this is a trap. Look up that group a, a big time. Listen to Admiral Akbar on this case. Look up that group where the connections go back to. Don't fall into the trap right away like, oh, these are feds. Does that, they're, they're, they want you to ideologically align with them. Don't do it. And say, oh, they're not one of Of course they're not one of us. Of course they're not one of us. The trap. See, these guys like Bongino start with a conclusion and they twist the story to fit it. He's really confused or something because he's saying that Patriot Front is a left-wing group. Therefore, no conservative should feel compelled to call them out or criticize them because they're not our guys. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there's nothing left-wing about Patriot Front. You, you look at the manifesto and their public statements, and it's a return to tradition with the same pining for a mythical America that guys like Boingo Boingo spend most of their time pining for as well. And, and part of the reason Patriot Front has been able to grow their movement, and they are the, as far as we know, they are the largest active white supremacist group. And they, I think the most recent statistics have them putting over 80% of all white nationalist, white supremacist content out in the United States for at least the last two years, which is quite a significant number. But as we said, they're obsessed with the aesthetic, with the optics. But part of the reason they've been able to grow this is because their propaganda mirrors other slightly less extreme right-wing propaganda. They attack Black Lives Matter and Antifa when more mainstream MAGA right-wing influencers did the same thing. And then when the right pivoted to attacking the trans community, so did Patriot Front. So the, the left-wing thing is, is just, it's a joke. I went through their entire manifesto for prepping for this, and there is not one left-wing idea in the fucking thing. No, we will not be linking to it in the show notes. We don't platform their shit. Yeah, so Patriot Front broke off from a group called Vanguard America. And the leader of Patriot Front was part of Vanguard America. There was a whole infight and back and forth. And Thomas Russo, the leader of Patriot Front, took X number of followers and created Patriot Front and essentially just abandoned the, the Vanguard America name. But the earliest archive of the Patriot Front Twitter account it still listed the website for Vanguard America because they were still like working on rebranding and moving their site and all these things. And it's worth pointing out the Vanguard America website, which was originally on the Patriot Front Twitter account, it was listed as their site, was bloodandsoil.org, which is <laughs> bloodandsoil.org. It's not a very popular slogan among leftists. <laughs> they chant that at the Antifa rally. So wait, no, they don't. <sighs> Yeah, there is no one specifically left wing idea in anything they believe. Not one. It's just a different shade of right. Yeah. And ideology wise, there's nothing in there that Bongino probably has much of an issue with, save the optics of it that make his side look bad. I think this is simply the latest flare up of what these guys refer to internally as the optics war. It's the root of the reason why former GOP congressional candidate Paul Nellen doxed Douglas Mackey, a.k.a. Ricky Vaughn, who just got convicted of violations of the Klan Act as a result. 
Yeah, we cover that pretty extensively. You can go back and listen to episode 52 of our podcast if you want a refresher on the the Mackie case. We did an interview about that with SPLC's Michael Hayden. But this is an argument that the white nationalist right has been having forever about whether it's better to do things like march in big semi-organized groups, carrying, carrying tiki torches and chanting things like blood and soil, mm-hmm. which is what, what happened in the lead up to Unite the Right. Or should they be more stealthy about their beliefs? Should they hide their power levels and get jobs as, say, congressional staffers for, I don't know, Arizona House mm. of Representatives Republicans like Paul Gosar? Weird. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Here he's hiring. Yeah. <laughs> it's not likely to be settled anytime soon, but the dissembling around it sure is something else. You know, I look at a guy like Dan Bongino and I say, uh, yeah, so if you don't think these people are a threat, the white nationalists are real and they are a clear and present danger, then explain Allen, Texas Mm -hmm. or Poway, California or El Paso or Kansas City or Pittsburgh or Buffalo and explain how that violence happened and who really did it without claiming it's a false flag psyop based on a QAnon Twitter personality. Yeah, and you can also, while you're at it, explain why in Baltimore there was an attempt to sabotage the power grid and plunge the city into darkness and kick off the race war that the FBI just thwarted. The planners of that attack included a guy by the name of Brandon Russell, most recently involved with a group you may have heard of called the Adam Waffen Division. Yeah, so there, there's a reason why the government keeps naming racially motivated domestic violent extremists as a number one threat in America. And it's not to annoy MAGA influencers on Rumble. Yeah, I mean, it's because they're fucking dangerous. Yeah. Finally, you may have heard about the tragic death of Jordan Neely, a homeless man who has reportedly struggled with mental illness throughout his life. Neely died while in transit in the New York City subway system. There are conflicting reports on the exact details of what happened, but the consensus appears to be that Neely was behaving erratically. He appeared unwell. Most reports have said that he made no direct threats to any of the passengers on the train, but he did make people there uncomfortable. And for the crime of making people a little bit uncomfortable, it seems, Neely was at first subdued and eventually died at the hands of an ex-Marine named Daniel Penny. He used what would be referred to in grappling terms as a rear naked choke. He essentially came up behind Neely Put this hold on his neck. It's a blood choke. It blocks both carotid arteries to the brain. Properly applied, the person who has it applied to them goes out to sleep within about 10 seconds. And Neely held it. Sources differ on this, but the least amount of time I've seen anyone say that he held it on for was four minutes. Yeah, I've seen anywhere between four and 15. Right. I don't know. What's true? I don't know if if anyone knows for sure. Four minutes is enough to cause brain damage at minimum. Absolutely. Immediately after the death of Neely, Penny was not named as the responsible party, nor was he charged. Then came several days of protests in New York City out of this perceived injustice, and eventually the Manhattan DA's office arrested Daniel Penny and charged him with manslaughter in the death of Jordan Neely. Now, the the case itself is several months away. It's scheduled for July 17th of this year. And I imagine we'll have plenty to say about the case itself once it's underway. But in the meantime, we did feel like it was important to sort of brace for impact on this one. Because realistically, what we're looking at here is another Kyle Rittenhouse scenario. And and Rittenhouse, you'll remember, was a 17-year-old who showed up in Kenosha, Wisconsin, during the civil unrest there in 2020 he shot three men and killed two and after a very well publicized trial he was found not guilty on all charges as for daniel penny who again is charged with manslaughter and the death of a mentally unwell black man who may not have threatened anyone on that subway penny is already a right-wing celebrity now 
<laughs> They've put it all on the line for this guy already. There are reports that over $2 million has been raised for his defense. Tim Pool says, and I repeat says, because the man is not trustworthy, he says he donated $20,000 personally to Daniel Penny. And the right is going to defend this man no matter what evidence emerges later. He is one of theirs. They have bought a ticket and they're on the Daniel Penny defense team now, metaphorically speaking. It's just what they do. They're already at work smearing Jordan Neely every way they can based on sketchy reporting from places like the Daily Mail and the Post Millennial. And let's be honest, these places put out a lot of junk news that then gets quietly edited or removed later. They did this with the shooting in Nashville, Tennessee recently. A source told them the shooter at the school had therapy sessions from the pastor of the head of the church. Remember, this is a private Christian school attached to a church. So the Daily Mail said that the shooter had therapy sessions with the pastor, but she stopped going to the sessions for an unknown reason. And it was related to the shooting because the pastor's daughter was killed in the mass shooting. Again, our heart goes out to the victims that day, but the point here is that the story wasn't correct. The Daily Mail published it, it went all over social media, then they quietly retracted it because it wasn't true. The shooter wasn't meeting with the church's pastor. So look, what the Daily Mail is reporting about Jordan Neely may have some truth to it, but it also might not. And even if it's true, they're reporting on a young man who was admittedly mentally unwell and wasn't getting the treatment he needed. But nevertheless, the right is taking the reporting, so-called reporting so far, as gospel. If it connects with the narrative and talking points they want to be selling, they're running with it and making it look like yet another black man had it coming. It's gross, it's mm -hmm. really gross, but that's what this is. Look, their audience is absolutely fine with believing that. They're fine with believing all or at least most black men are criminals. So I guess Penny was doing some kind of public service in their eyes. It, it's, it's terrible. But even when you see guys like Ron DeSantis and now a bunch of other politicians have come out and said Daniel Penny is a good Samaritan. That's what they're doing. You don't you don't use that phrase. I mean we both grew up in the church. Yeah, a good Samaritan is, that is that's, not what the good no. Samaritan did. No. 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 Go back and read that again. Tell me where the good Samaritan killed the guy on the road. That's not how this worked at all. No. No, it is it is absolutely not. And even in a modern context, a good Samaritan is a person who would have stood up and fed this hungry person, this thirsty person, this person who was just completely upset at the circumstances that they had found themselves in. The good Samaritan would have done something about this rather than if they found your wallet on the street, they would leave the money in it before they gave it back to you. I mean, this a good Samaritan is not. A killer. No. A, a just. No. Ah. I think the only way they can sell this is racism. Mm -hmm. If the victim was white, he wouldn't be using that term. Nope. He just wouldn't. He wouldn't. Mm -mm. Daniel Penny is white. And to these people, he's good. He's an ex-Marine. I've seen some pretty gross social media posts fawning over Penny's looks and <laughs> his jawline and his cheeks and it's it's hero worship and two million dollars apparently is just a start because they think this is how they win the culture war by defending what they consider to be a heroic white man over a black man they think had it coming they won't say he had it coming because he's black but it's more than implied and their audience is hearing exactly what they need to hear yeah, it's uncomfortable talking about this, thinking about this, reading through this. It, it it reminds me of the Rittenhouse case in a lot of ways because, yes, he was found not guilty, but the whole thing, the whole thing stinks. Mm -hmm. What what was he? What was Kyle Rittenhouse doing there in the first place? Yeah, why did he have an AR fifteen on the street at seventeen? Oh, okay, he had his day in court. The court said he acted in self-defense, but what about the, the series of bad decisions by him, by his parents, mm -hmm. that 
put him in that place that led to this event and kind of zooming out a little bit. Does anyone think going back to that event and that moment, did the right reflexively defend Kyle Rittenhouse because they absolutely knew he was innocent? (laughs) No, no way. That was an added perk kind of, but they didn't really care about Kyle Rittenhouse as is seen by his post shooting career. And they don't really care about Daniel Penny either. These guys go to jail, whatever. The right still gets to fight the culture war over it. If Penny gets off, then great. Maybe he can go have a career in right-wing media now because they made him into a star. But really, should he be? Should this be the way our society operates? I say no. Yeah. Very emphatic no. I don't think we're in a healthy place when killing a black man or an Antifa (laughs) or some other perceived enemy in in the case of Rittenhouse, I don't think that should be enough to make you famous. I really don't. And there has to be a better way. When killing the other is not only acceptable, but applauded by a sect of society, that's the path to fascism, folks. There's no getting around it at this point. MAGA is a fascist movement. Indeed it is. And we'll keep you posted on this case as it moves forward. Stay tuned. Thanks for listening to the Did Nothing Wrong podcast. If you want to hear more, you can go to didnothingwrongpod.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at James, the word four, and the letter M, all one word, and Grizza, B-J-J, G-R-Z-A, B-J-J, as well as D-N-W pod. Thanks again for tuning in. And remember, everyone mentioned did nothing wrong.